Welcome everyone. Today, we are thrilled to bring to you an update on the impressive trauma resuscitation program out of New Orleans, Louisiana. We're calling it Blood Medics Part Deux, of course. And you can watch part one of the webinar on prodigyems.com, which was recorded back in May of 2022. I am Hillary Gates, Director of Educational Strategy at Prodigy EMS, and we'd like to thank 410 Medical, the maker of the LifeFlow Rapid Infuser, for supporting today's education so that all of you will earn one free CAPSI credit. At the conclusion of the webinar, all registrants will receive an email from Prodigy EMS with your CE information. Everyone wants to hear about the latest in the administration of blood in the field. What are the successes, the challenges, and what are the lessons learned? Well, we have that for you today. New Orleans EMS is now two years into their blood medics program, and they have treated over 200 patients, trained even more blood medics, updated the age criteria, and tweaked their pit crew approach to the intervention, among other things. Today, we'll be hearing from the following speakers. Dr. Meg Marino, who is the director of New Orleans EMS, as well as the medical director. Major Tom Dransfield, who is New Orleans EMS's quality assurance and safety officer. Lieutenant Joseph Frazier, who is an assistant shift supervisor and a blood medic for New Orleans EMS, as well as Dr. Mark Peel, associate medical director of Wake Med Mobile Critical Care and founder and chief medical officer of 410 Medical. Take it away, y'all. Thank you so much, Hillary. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk about our blood program at New Orleans EMS. I'm Dr. Meg Marino. I'm the director and medical director of New Orleans EMS. And today we're gonna to be talking about our pre-hospital blood program, where we give blood to our trauma patients and save lives. Today we have myself, uh, Major Tom Dransfield, Lieutenant Joseph Frazier, both from New Orleans EMS, and Dr. Mark Peel, the founder of uh, the LifeLow and Associate Medical Director of WakeMed Mobile Critical Care. And now I'll kick it over to Tom. Okay. Thanks, Dr. Marino. Thanks, Hillary, for having us uh, back again, and so we can uh, give you an update of where we are in our program. So basically... Um, you know, as everybody remembers, or if you saw our previous podcast, what our motivation was. So back in 2018, we had a, a big surge in violence here in the city of New Orleans. So our medics were getting frustrated. So they they wanted to do something better. So we went into uh, discussions with our then medical director, Dr. Uh, Emily Nichols, and uh, the trauma center and what how we could make this a more definitive uh, care at point of contact. So working with Dr. Juan Duchesne there at university, um, we came up with like a pre-hospital blood program. So we started doing the research on that. So um, so basically this is our timeline. Uh, you know, we started in the 2019-ish looking for that, uh, started talking to them and getting some research. So I started reaching out to all the big people, you know, that were doing blood at the time, San Antonio, um, those guys, uh, and then the guys at uh, Cypress Creek EMS at the time and Harris County ESD. So those were my big three that I went to for uh, guidance and mentorship in this. So they helped me immensely in the process of figuring it all out. We were rolling, had things going, and then we had some internal disasters in the city. Uh, basically, we had a, a building collapse that um, that tied up a lot of our resources and time uh, that, that prolonged event uh, for that. Then we had a cyber attack that hit the city. And we had, of course, Mardi Gras then popped in. So we were doing good, trying to get our feedback on us. And you can see our timeline there, 2020, uh, COVID hit, right? And so that kind of put everything on on pump the brakes. We uh, we finally got into that in a good spot, started working on it again, was ready to roll out in August of 2021. And then Hurricane Ida hit the city, which is a Category 4 storm that delayed our rollout. After we did our education, we got rolling finally up and going in October of 2021. We went live with 29 of our blood medics is what we call them. And then um, we've been rocking and rolling ever since. Uh, so as of uh, the 7th of November, uh, we had two, we've had 212 administrations of blood, pre-hospital blood here in New Orleans. Um, I'll let Dr. Marino kind of talk a little bit more so about like our medical control and what motivated us on that end of stuff. 
Thank you so much, Tom. And if you'd like more information about our background, we'd love it if you check out part one of this webinar. Um, we go more in detail into the background. So I'll just briefly review um, how we made these decisions. So a lot of people ask, why didn't we use whole blood? It's an interesting question. Really, it wasn't available. It was more expensive and it wouldn't, um, the blood center wouldn't allow us to rotate it in and out um, the way they do with peripheral um, uh, PRBCs. So we also felt that using whole blood would subtract from the community blood supply during COVID-19, which we now know um, the more blood we give in the pre-hospital setting, the less blood we give in the hospital. So we're less concerned about that now. Um, why did we use PRBCs instead of plasma? That's another great question. Um, we chose to prioritize O2 delivery given our very short transport times. Um, and then why are we only doing trauma patients? So there's only one trauma center. So it made the collection of data a little bit easier. Um, and the idea is that we're going to start small with trauma and then grow out to our medical patients as well. So one thing that we're doing in New Orleans that is different than other EMS agencies is that we're giving cold blood. Um, honestly, when we started, we couldn't afford the warmer. It was about $5,000 and we were really, it was during COVID times and we were really skimping, um, you know, scraping every penny together that we could. And the warmers just were fiscally uh, out of reach. So we looked at the data and several EMS agencies in Europe do not warm blood prior to transfusion. And in the ER, they're not necessarily warming blood prior to transfusion. We found that infusing five milliliters of cold blood only reduces the core temperature by about one degree Celsius. And when we talked to our trauma team about it, they really said, just get the patient to us alive and we'll fix the hypothermia later. So another question we are asked pretty frequently is why are we using the life flow infuser? Now, if you're not familiar with the life flow, I suggest you um, check it out. The way I describe it is that it's a really fancy water gun that gives blood very, very quickly. Um, it's faster than giving um, giving blood via uh, just gravity. Um, it's smaller than hospital infusers. It's very user-friendly and it's great for multitasking. I've actually been in the back of an ambulance giving blood with one hand and bagging with the other. So it's definitely something that is easy to use in a pre-hospital setting. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marino. And um, just to give everybody kind of an update where we are on our program timeline. And like I said, we started in October of 2021. So now November of 2023, 24 months in, a little over that, we have uh, 52 blood medics currently. And uh, our blood medics just have a little bit of special uh, additional education. It's like we teach them a little bit more about how to use this particular uh, the life flow devices and uh, look for the the basically a better good target that's going to be for the blood uh, administration and documentation wise too. We want them to document some certain things for us, but our blood medics. Uh, they work on a sprint car, which uh, the, basically is an SUV, a chase car, a fly car, other places in the country call it that. Uh, so they carry two units of PRBCs um, with their, on their sprint car. Uh, most days we have two blood medics working, uh, but a minimum is one. And then we keep a back stock of 10 units of blood here at, at headquarters. And um, it's uh, we, we have a four, we're very fortunate here that we have a blood center locally that it can get us blood 24 7, 365. Uh, usually it's within an hour of administration that we're getting a restock back. So, um, if we ever had a, a big large scale event or anything like that, they would be able to, to, you know, ramp us up some additional blood pretty quickly, right? And the other, other big thing that we had with our program is we updated our age criteria. Okay, so uh, we started out just doing ages 12 and above is when we first started the program. And then uh, unfortunately, uh, the way the world works and everything like that, we were encountering, our medics were encountering some children, um, you know, that were exposed to this gun violence and other things. So um, they were calling those on a med control one-on-one -on -one basis. It's like, that's how we had it set up. So we decided, uh, we discussed it amongst us and the trauma center. And then we said like, 
seeing what other people in the country were doing, we kind of decided and lowered our criteria to five, age of five years old. So that's standing order for that. But anything below that, they can always call med control. We still have that caveat in place for our medics. Uh, so we changed that. And so the, the ages five to 10 get one unit of blood, one gram of calcium and one gram of TXA. And anything 10 and above uh, gets two, two and two. OK, kind of see our criteria that didn't change anything on that Our our number criteria. Another thing that came out as a result of the medics doing this and figuring out a better way to make it flow is we came up. Uh, everybody's familiar with pit crew CPR, right? Uh, so we uh, we took that and we did it kind of New Orleans style. We did pit crew blood and we used crew. We call it with a K just because for our Mardi Gras heritage and because they're Mardi Gras crews. Uh, but anyway, so we we basically was a sign in roles. And this was from feedback strictly from the blood medics of saying, like, how can y'all make this better? How can we make it better for you? They said, let's implement this. It's the same concept. So everybody gets assigned a role. The blood medic is is primarily in charge of getting the initial temp in, uh, getting the blood set up, and then totally solely in charge of doing the blood administration. Our blood administration is done by two medics, is how we like to do it. It's kind of like similar to an RSI type event. Uh, so you can focus on what what you need to do like the blood medic does the blood medic and the other medic is responsible for other patient care if they need advanced airway additional ivs they can assist with whatever needs to be done so that's something that we came up with and came did that a little bit of our equipment uh you know like i said uh, dr marino was saying check out our our, our first uh, video of this and we went a little bit more in depth over this stuff but it's just basically what we carry it out and some of our numbers. So here's basically a breakdown of, of the administrations that we've had over the, the time period. We had 15 that first uh, couple of months, two months of uh, 21, had 104 in 2022. And at the time of 11-7 um, of 23, we had 93 administrations. Uh, predominantly, uh, you can see there, most of our uh, patients uh, are male, very few females. Uh, that and then um 83 percent of our stuff is penetrating trauma is so that's the bulk of our business we have a uh, a few uh mvcs falls crush injuries and stuff that has received blood and we've had eight uh medical administrations is what we call it it's just kind of a catch-all category and those are the ones they call med control for and get the authorization that could be um a gi bleed or an obstetrics or something like that you'll notice by the map there uh, you can see the little X, and that is, with the arrow going to it, that's the trauma center. And that's a heat map displaying where all our administrations have been. And so that indicates that we're we're pretty close to the hospital. Uh, New Orleans, I like to call it a, a, a small, big city, or a big, small city, however you want to look at it. But it's geographically, we're very close together, but it's it's got big city problems, right? We have big city crime, big city issues. So... Um, it just kind of puts it in representation when you look at it on a heat map. Uh, we've used uh, quite a few cat tourniquets. Uh, our, we have a good working relationship with our police department, and they're not shy or bashful about putting one on. Uh, and we've also adopted into our part of our stuff is junctional tourniquets. So it used to be our tactical medics were the only ones that carried those. Uh, but uh, based on the feedback from the blood medics, they said, hey, can we put it in the blood bag? It's like, sure. And so we put that in there, and we also added a pelvic binder in there for those trauma patients. So um, we've had quite a few of those junctionals placed, more than I thought we would, honestly. Uh, but uh, they've we've had some good success stories with those. Um, kind of a breakdown here, what this is, 24 months in, uh, most of our patients, uh, like 66%, get our full bundle. gets the blood, the calcium, and the TXA. 17% uh, get blood only. 16% get blood and calcium, and then only 1% get blood and TXA. A lot of this is just proximity to the hospital. We're not going to delay transport or anything. So whatever they can get done uh, in route is what they can get done. So it just depends on where they are and, and how proficient they are. Some of our blood medics, uh, like Joe here, is um, one of the heavy hitters. He's number one. He's uh, He works nights, so he gets a lot more uh, opportunities, apparently. Uh, so... Um, He's leading the pack on on blood administration. So he's got the process down pretty refined uh, right now. So I'd say he's he's not like one of our heavy hitters. So so I'm going to turn the, the floor over to Joe then and let him kind of tell you about his experiences being a heavy hitter and one of our rock stars of blood medics. Thank you, Tom. 
Um, so yeah, you're right. Working nights, I get a lot of practice at it. So I've become very proficient at it. Uh, but I'm gonna talk about, you know, how, how our initial approach went. So in the beginning, uh, we targeted a broad range of patients for blood administration. And, uh, we, we, we felt like, you know, we could save all of those patients, uh, or not all of them, but most of them. So, uh, we, we came to a realization that, uh, you know, we, there's certain patients that the, the blood's not going to save. We can't save everyone. Um, and we acknowledged the limitations of, of the approach that we had. Uh, we discovered what we found out was that the precious blood resources uh, were being allocated to patients that had unsurvivable injuries. And uh, so we, we had to kind of realize this and change some things up and think about how we approach uh, certain patient popu uh, populations. So we we had a learning curve. We evolved over time and understanding patient the patient selection criteria. Uh, we and just for an example, like uh, patients with penetrating trauma to the head, like uh, not they don't necessarily need blood because it's not a volume problem. Uh, it's you know it's the injury to the brain. Um, so we kind of we started recognizing, hey, let's let's maybe not give the blood on this. We just became a little more selective on uh, the patients that we were given the blood to. Uh, trauma codes, uh, for example, uh, you know, several gunshot wounds, uh, unsurvivable injuries. We, we just realized that, you know, the blood wasn't going to change the outcome. So uh, we kind of evolved over time and started to understand that. Uh, we gained insights into uh, identifying the patients who would benefit most from the blood transfusions. And these are those patients that, uh, you know, they may have had an isolated gunshot wound to the extremity. They've lost uh, copious amounts of blood uh, before we got there. They had the tourniquets on, they're hypotensive, they're, they're, they're dying right in front of us, and they haven't quite went over that cliff yet, and, you know, we can pull them back. Uh, we improved uh, our precision. We developed the refined thought process for the patient selection. Uh, we focused on optimizing outcomes by directing blood resources to those with the highest likelihood of survival, like I was just talking about. And so in this, in the next slide, um, this is actually a blood administration. We wear body-worn cameras here in New Orleans now, and we started doing that shortly after uh, we started with the blood program, and our intentions were to use it for training new blood medics and, you know, seeing how we can better the blood process. And uh, I'm just going to narrate through this video. Uh, uh, it doesn't have sound on, on this particular clip. But here, uh, I've already made it to the back of the truck. But in, in the beginning of the video, I walk up to the medics who are already on scene taking care of the patient. Uh, they've already gotten verbal consent. And so, like Tom saying, I approached it like an RSI. I went to the truck. I started setting up everything. And see, as they wheel the patient in, uh, I'm already getting ready to spike the blood bag. I've got all my equipment laid out. Uh, you see our the the little cooler right there. That's our thermal isolation chamber. And that's what we keep the blood in. So I had it set out where it was readily available. Uh, I had my life flow laid out. I had everything I needed. And so here I'm just setting all that equipment up. And so I'm in that the the position at the head, going back to the uh pit crew blood administration. So I'm at the head of the patient. And my sole purpose is this blood. Uh, you see Mac here, he's going to establish access. Uh, the EMTs on the other, the right side of the patient, they're put them on a monitor. They're getting vitals. They're doing any bleeding control. Uh, we're, you know, we're following the March mnemonic and we're making sure that we stop the bleed before we put the, the life-saving blood in there because we don't want to put the blood in and it come right back out because we haven't controlled the bleeding. Um, so there I get the, the fluids and the blood spiked, uh, with the life flow tubing. And here I kind of, I kind of lost my life flow for a second, but, uh, I threw something on top of it. So it took me a second to find it, but I gather myself and, uh, you can see the EMT he's over there. He's getting a manual set of vitals because we want that manual set of vitals. We, we want to ensure that we have a very accurate blood pressure and generally we'll get a manual set and then he'll pop the automated cuff on there and we'll have two sets. Here I'm loading the life flow. Uh, we make sure that we point it towards the sky when we load it, because uh, if you don't, if you don't point it up, you'll get an air bubble in there. So instead of getting the whole 10 ml of uh, blood infused with the squeeze of the life flow, you, you may only be getting eight. So we want to point it up when we prime it and I prime it with fluid uh, first. That's my preference. Some people prime it uh, with 
two or three squeezes of fluid and then they start with the blood. But I always prime the entire line with with fluids first. And so I have this ready and essentially I'm just waiting on him to uh, get get the IV established for me. And so here I've already started administering this first unit of blood. And we're still on scene because we re we're very close to to the hospital. If if you look up at the time in the right hand upper right hand corner of the screen, we've only been on scene right now. Uh, we've been five six minutes. Um, and so we got a three four minute transport to the hospital. So we're trying to get all all this situated before before we pull off. Um, and at this point, the patient's actually beginning to speak a little bit to us. Uh, when he first came in, he was very uh uptunded it's not speaking gcs of 13 ish um just really didn't look good and uh so here max getting a second line while he's doing that i'm done with the the first unit of blood already and if you remember when i told you to look up at the clock we were five minutes in so we're a minute later and i've already administered that entire first unit of blood um so i'm gonna spike this second unit and as I'm doing that, Mac is given the TXA in his second IV that he's established in the right arm. And he's going to give the TXA. He's going to flush that. And then he'll turn around. We give two grams of TXA, and he's going to turn around right after that, flush the IV really good. And then we're going to give uh, the, the calcium through that second peripheral IV as well. And so at this point, both units of blood are done. Um, we're, we're ready to go. We're ready to leave. Um, I'm actually telling the EMT here, uh, let's, let's go ahead and roll. We, we got, we have everything done and we have a three or four minute transport to the, to the trauma center. Um, and Mac, the, the paramedic there, he doesn't even really, it went so fast. He doesn't even realize that, that I'm finished. He thinks that I'm still given the first unit of blood and it's just that quick. Uh, a lot of us, we've given it so much that we're we're just so precise with it, and it's just smooth. And right here, he realizes, and you can see his face; he's just amazed that that I'm I'm finished already. And that's that's the face he's when he realizes that 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 I'm done. And so it's a very smooth process. We we give a lot of blood here. Uh, we we've gotten really good at it over time. It saved a lot of lives and, you know, we've got these body worn cameras that uh, we can use that footage and, and learn from it, learn from our mistakes, find out things we can do better. Uh, so we began to have the blood medics wear them while, while they were on duty for that purpose. And the goal was to record the blood process and to, like I said, to utilize and training and education of other responders. When we train new blood medics, we wanted to be able to show them the process that way they kind of, they can form their own uh game plan per se like when they how they're going to approach it how they're going to go into it and all the footage is is a compliant with hipaa laws and any videos that we use uh it it's redacted so we don't we don't violate any hipaa laws with the uh footage from the body worn cameras and so the I, timing um the timing that was uh of having the body worn cameras start just right around the time that our blood program started was really helpful in helping us assess how we use that time on scene. And what we noticed is that when we implemented the blood program, there was no increase in our time on scene for trauma patients. And so, you know, a lot of people say, well, why would you stay and um, resuscitate a patient when we know that in trauma patients, you need to load and go. And what we found is that, you know, by using the same amount of on scene time that we've had um, this entire, you know, for the history of the last several years, um, we've been able to increase our survivability of these um, life-threatening uh, penetrating trauma. Injury. We're providing that definitive care at point of contact, and that's the big thing that, um, you know, we, we've we had to drill into our people. We were so time crunch sensitive of that, and, like, you know, we're very good at trauma, unfortunately, because of just by the circumstances we, we roll around in here. Uh, but um, so it, it was a it was a process, and Joe could probably speak to that a little bit more. You just want to hurry, 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 and then, you know that doesn't it's not conducive to doing the best care sometimes it's the speed is not so or is quicker in some cases um this it it once you once you get 
get to rolling it's, it just goes so quickly and you, you the game kind of slows down a little bit with the 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 more use of it you get and so like Tom was saying we realized hey we can we can slow down and we can get all this done and we'll arrive at the trauma center with a a much more stable patient for them and uh that's that's been what we've learned and so yeah so this slide you know these are some of the lessons that we've learned we practice and repractice with the life flow because not everybody has the opportunities to use it as much as I have. So um, even I've ran calls with other blood medics and they're like, this, this is only my second time doing it. Can just, can you just help me out? Make sure I don't mess anything up. And so even in our downtime at the station, we'll, we have life flows uh, near our blood everywhere. everywhere. <laughs> and we'll pick them up and practice, just uh, get used to it. Uh, the more you use it, the more familiar you're going to be with it. And we found out in a few instances where uh, we we had to use an infuser bag. I think there was one time that we used. Uh, we Just had some, once, yeah. Had to use a rapid infuser bag. It is slow. Uh, you get used to using this life flow and you get all this done in six, five, six minutes. And then you go to using a rapid infuser bag and you're just sitting there and you're like, this, this is boring. Like we, it's, it's not working. We got to fit. We, Got to figure something else out and you just trying to squeeze it and it's just slow. And uh, so we had to remember as well that we need, we need to march on track. Uh, the first couple of administrations, you, you would, your patient's not bleeding because they're so uh, hypovolemic and we started administering blood and all of a sudden we're finding wounds. Oh, uh, well, we didn't, we didn't know that was there. It wasn't bleeding. And so now that we're putting blood back into the system, uh, we're having to remember, Hey, we got to stop these bleeds first. So we got to make sure we find, every injury and control the bleeding because if you put the blood back in there, it's just going to run back right back out. If you haven't, if you haven't marched, um, use your full array of tools. Um, you, we have the, the junctional tourniquets, uh, they've the three times they've been used. They've worked great. Um, cat tourniquets, uh, the combat galls, you use, use your, in, your entire toolbox. Um, and, Lastly, blood transfusion is not currently a billable procedure. Um, so we we learned that after we started, uh, and it's approximately fifteen hundred uh, per patient, and uh, we can't bill for that. So we're just kind of eating the cost of that. But you know, to to save all the lives that we have with with that, you know, I, I think it's a fair a fair trade off. Thank you, Joe. Uh, now I'm gonna kind of turn it over to Dr. Peel and he's going to kind of go over some of the research data that uh, has resulted from from the actions of Joe and his uh, compadres have done out in the field. So Dr. Peel, welcome. Thank you. And uh, thanks for the story, Joe. It was, it was it's always incredible to watch you guys in action. And uh, I thought what we'd do is, is present some of the actual uh, research data that have come out of the work you're doing. And so I've had the privilege of working with Meg and Tom and the whole team at Tulane, Dr. Duchesne, on analyzing some of the outcomes um, to try to back up the anecdotal reports that uh, the guys are seeing in the field of life sa lives saved. So we actually presented, analyzed and presented recently at a big surgical trauma meeting, um, a comparison of patients who uh, got blood under the new blood medic program with patients of similar injury severity in the three years prior to implementation of the program. We called this bundle of care that Tom and Joe described advanced resuscitative care, a term that actually comes from the tactical combat casualty care guidelines from the military. And that ARC bundle or advanced resuscitative care bundle is the two units of PAC cells, the TXA and the calcium that Joe described administering. And we looked at patients then with penetrating trauma, so shot in the uh, torso uh, and, ext and or extremities with hypotension. So either with a systolic under 70 or a shock index over 1.2. And so we just analyzed those sickest patients only. And then as Joe mentioned, took out patients that were thought to have unsurvivable injury. So isolated brain injury or cardiac arrest on the scene. And most, just to be clear, most other studies that have looked at, looked at pre-hospital blood have similarly uh, excluded those patients. 
So here's the results. I could talk about this for a long time. There's a lot more data here than we can present on this webinar. So the patients um, who received blood were actually sicker. They had a shock index of 1.4, which is uh, basically near death compared to the control patients. The patient didn't get blood. They were happened to be a little less sick in the field. But by the time they arrived at the trauma center, the patients who got the ARC bundle had a basically normal shock index. They had been resuscitated to the point where their blood pressure and socket shock index were normal. And as you can see in the bottom box, this resulted in a dramatically lower mortality. So about 11% of the patients who got blood died compared to the pre-group where all the interventions were performed that had been performed for years with the absence of blood, they had about a 25% mortality. And so it's a pretty dramatic shift. This is the first study that has shown that we can save lives to hospital discharge with pre-hospital blood transfusion in civilian EMS. No other study has shown this before in ground EMS. And another fascinating uh, bullet, which maybe we'll have, um, or fascinating point, which maybe we'll have Joe address later is the pre-hospital intubation rate went down to almost zero. Only one patient in that bundle, in that bundle group who got blood required pre-hospital intubation. And as Joe, as you heard Joe describe, the act of resuscitation improves the patient's mental status to the point where they're managing their own airway and breathing and then don't need a heroic intervention, which itself can cause further injury or death. And so that's another dramatic finding, which we'll also be presenting and publishing soon. Here's a kind of a timeline that really illustrates the beauty of this, of this process. So if you think about where care is not being provided, where effective resuscitation is not being provided, we can call those dead zones. And that's in the time between injury and the EMS crew arriving, that's a dead zone. And in New Orleans, their arrival time, their response time is super fast. They're there in minutes. And in general, care is not being provided. In the group who didn't get blood, there's a further dead zone, which encompasses all of the um, scene and transport time. So around 13 to 15 minutes. Now, of course, care is being provided when there's no blood given. Tourniquets are applied, oxygen is given, maybe an airway is managed, but there's no resuscitation provided. In the ARC bundle group, you see that blood administration starts somewhere around seven minutes after arrival. I think that was almost the exact timestamp in Joe's case that he presented to you. And by the time they get to the trauma bay, two units of blood, two of TXA, and two of calcium have been given. That resuscitation is complete. Whereas the patients who don't get blood in the field arrive, and it's somewhere between seven and 20 minutes later in the trauma room before effective resuscitation actually starts. The average 12 minutes here before any blood is given. So that's that much more time that the patient is in shock, may need to be intubated, maybe spiraling downhill further, whereas the patients who get resuscitated in the field closer to the point of injury receive effective care and arrive through the trauma bay doors in a much more stable condition. So we think that's probably a big explanation for why the mortality is so dramatically improved. And then we actually um, analyzed the subset of patients in this, in this study who are kids. And sadly, um, there are a good number of kids who are involved in gun violence nationally and in uh, New Orleans in particular. And so we looked at those kids um, and there were, turned out to be 13 within the group that we studied who were eligible for uh, analysis. Um, again, we excluded those who were already dead on the scene, who had had a cardiac arrest in the field, and the one patient who had an isolated uh, gunshot wound to the head. So that left nine patients left over. Um, they were aged eight to 18 years and all had uh, a hypotension in the field. And if you remember, hypotension is the single biggest risk factor for death in pediatric trauma. If someone arrives to the hospital hypotensive, they have a dramatically higher risk of mortality, up to 50% if they arrive to the trauma bay hypotensive. So all these kids had penetrating trauma and hypotension in the field, all received blood, TXA and calcium, and all of them had normal, normal blood pressure on arrival to the trauma bay. And guess what? All of them lived. Now, this is a small study. Doesn't prove, um, it's not, couldn't be considered proof of, of benefit of blood, 
um, for all children with penetrating trauma, but it's pretty good evidence. And the fact that a group of kids with a high risk of mortality were able to all walk out of the hospital is, is a, a testament to the incredible work that New Orleans team has done in developing this program and to the value of, of effective transfusion, effective resuscitation in the field to someone who's dying of hemorrhagic shock. So congratulations to you guys. This, I think, is pretty dramatic data. It was presented recently at the Pediatric Trauma Society, which happened to be in New Orleans this year and will hopefully be published soon. Thanks, uh, Dr. Peel. Um, Dr. Marino, do you want to kind of wrap it up what our plans for the future are? Or? I'd like to echo what Mark said, you know, looking at the data, there are patients that were in, you know, field traumatic arrest um, that we brought back to life with blood. And I think, you know, if you were going to just take home you know, one message from today, it's that we are bringing people back from death um, with blood. And as, um, as Joe said, you know, those that haven't gone over the cliff yet, um, we're able to save. So we're really excited about this program and we'd love to expand it as much as possible. So we've been expanding the number of blood medics over the last um, year. We now, um, you know, continue to have blood medic courses to train up our new employees. Um, we've been monitoring data with the trauma center um, and working very closely with them to make sure that we are providing the best care to every trauma patient possible. Um, and we're continuing to um, make contributions to medical knowledge. You know, as Dr. Peel said, this, um, you know, is the first study of its kind that shows that uh, pre-hospital blood can decrease mortality um, in a ground ambulance system. So in thinking about revisions or ways that we might change our program, you know, people ask, are you, you know, thinking about going to um, plasma? You know, we're doing so well with PRBCs, I'd be hard pressed to make any changes. Um, you know, they've been asking, um, are we going to stop and take time to warm the blood? We are trialing some blood warmers right now. Um, I will say the medics have asked questions like, do we have to use the blood warmers? And um, their concern is that it's going to slow down the time to blood administration. Um, but we are exploring that. And we are exploring giving, um, giving blood for medical hemorrhagic shock. So that would be the GI bleed or the OB bleed. Um, and we're looking at that. Um, right now we're just focused on our trauma patients, but, you know, I think in the next six to 12 months, we'll be expanding those to include medical, um, medical bleeds as well. One thing that we've really been looking for is finding funding for long-term use. Um, we've had meetings with Medicaid, um, in Louisiana to discuss whether or not they are interested in funding this. Um, when we met with them, they said, show us the data. So um, we look forward to um, follow-up meetings with them. Hopefully they will um, see, the, see the light and be uh, willing to fund these programs in the future. But um, if not, we've had um, a lot of really wonderful support, both from our administration and from city council um, that have said, you know, as long as you're able to continue to save lives with this program, we'll continue to fund it. And we'll just continue resuscitating. So our take home points for today is, you know, look, um, you know, we talked about the literature, um, look at the local databases to determine what the best product is for you. Um, look at your mechanisms of injury, arrival and transportation times and costs and resources. Really costs and resources were really um, limiting for us. You may be in, an, in a, um, high resource area where you don't have to worry as much about um, where your um, where your money is going. So definitely think about what resources you have available to you. Collaborate with both the trauma center and the transfusion medicine um, 
programs at your local hospitals, these are going to be really important allies for you as you build your blood program. You want to build advocates um, and mo maintain momentum and be patient with planning. These things take time. You know, we have a very successful pre-hospital blood program, but it's taken years in the making. So our hope is that you can learn from our experience. Um, so it won't take you as long as it's taken us. And really um, don't wait resuscitate. You need to spend time um, training your people. Manpower is required. Again, for our program to work, we have to have two medics at the scene. And we know that that's not possible in um, some lower resource areas. And um, grow your program and let us know how it goes. We'd love to hear how you're doing and um, compare our results. So um, I'd like to thank Prodigy EMS for making this possible. Um, I'd love to thank um, Dr. Mark Peel, um, uh, Lieutenant Joe Frazier, and Major Tom Transfield for making this program possible. We are so proud of the work that we're doing, and we're happy to have the opportunity to share it with you. Thank you so much.